Hey guys, my name is Wendy J. Olson. I'm your host. This season, we're changing things up a bit. We'll still be hearing some amazing stories from incredible women, but I'll also be sharing more about my insight into work as a healing coach. This season is packed with stories of survivors and thrivers, overcomers, and some of us just still walking through the messy middle. So don't feel left out at all. None of us have arrived, and we're all in this together. This is She's Got Gumption. We're so glad you're here. Pull up a chair. There's plenty of room at our table. On this week's episode, we have Marusha Murphy. If you don't know Marusha after this episode, you're going to want to. Marusha runs the coffee brand Perky Perky, and after successfully building multiple brands and companies, she decided a few years ago to go out on her own. Not only is Perky Perky an amazing cup of coffee, It's also a brand that's goal is to inspire and empower women every day through their first cup in the morning to that hang it in there to get you through the afternoon slump, all while building a community of women rising up to raise up one another in this culture of collaboration over competition. Marusha shares parts of her story she doesn't typically share publicly, and I'm honored she chose to share it here on the podcast. If there's one thing this gal has, it's gumption. Here's my conversation with Marusha Murphy. Marusha, I'm so glad we could do this. Oh my gosh, Wendy, I am so honored that you invited me to your show. Thank you. I got to listen to a little bit of your story at the Everyday Ordinary Jesus Workshop in Buda, Texas, and I was like, oh my gosh, she's somebody that I have to know and that everybody has to know. But even, <laughs> even better than that, everyone that I talked to that I kind of shared like a little bit about what I do and my journey and everything, they were like, you need to talk to Marusha. And I was really? Like, yeah, yes. That's so fun. You were so popular. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh my gosh. I feel so, I, I you know, I, um, I, number one, I'm so thankful just to be here. I, you know, I, this is actually something I don't share often publicly. So for me, sharing my Jesus story today feels like a big thing for me. Um, and, and it's not that it, it's not that I don't try to, I just, to me, ministry is everywhere. And so sometimes I forget to share my story. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so it's an honor to be here. And um, I know every single time I saw Jackie or someone that knew you at the event um, uh, talk about you, they just lit up. And so I was like, who is this Wendy girl? I need to know. <laughs> I'm so excited to meet her. Oh, I so love it. It's, I love it's it. honestly really exciting to be on this call with you today. It was, it's good to feel loved by everybody. <laughs> Doesn't always <laughs> happen. True. That's the truth, isn't it? <laughs> well, for people that don't know you, can you give us just like the five minute cliff notes of who you are, what you're about, what you do? Sure, sure. So um, as Wendy, as you mentioned, you know, I'm, my name is Marusha Murphy. Um, I, I'm a lover of Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus. And I'm also a mom of three daughters, um, currently ages 10, six, and four. The four-year-old will be five in a month. And, um, and then a, a, a wife to a great guy named Dennis. And um, yeah, for me, you know, I, I, I'm multi-passionate. I have built um, three companies. Um, over my life, I'm 39 years old at this point, built three companies, um, but didn't start as a, a company, a builder of companies <laughs> by any means. Um, I went to school, I went to a school in Florida called Rollins College for my undergrad, um, got my, ma- my undergrad in um, international relations, my master's, I went on to my master's degree um, in uh, mental health counseling and thought I was gonna be a therapist. Um, thought that's where my path was going to lead me. Um, but as God has it, he always has other plans. And what he actually sent me on is this trajectory of first becoming an admission counselor for the college I attended Rollins college. I was there for a little while. Um, and then I moved my way into multicultural affairs, um, was a grad assistant there and then assistant director and then became director of multicultural affairs at Rollins college and was doing that. Um, in totality, I think, well, from undergrad to director of multicultural affairs, 10 years total. Um, and it was a journey. It was a journey of, gosh, seeing myself as Jesus sees me, seeing others as Jesus sees them. And at the same time, 
Um, my work was intense, right? Because as a director of multicultural affairs, I am supporting people in the areas that they feel unseen on a, in a campus where it's predominantly, um, it's majority, you know, Caucasian, hetero, um, uh, Christian, yeah. and very wealthy. It was a private liberal arts college. So there was a good majority of students that could pay full pay. Um, to, and at that time, it was like $25,000 scholar, you know, $25,000 $25, per year um, to go. Now it's 65000 or something like that. Wow. I, I don't, I can't, I haven't confirmed those numbers, but that's what I've heard um, from other friends who graduated from there. So, yeah, it was intense. So I, I learned, I mean, geez, I, I had this beautiful opportunity to see God in the midst of all our stories and to see Jesus in the midst of love um, in our journeys and in the hurts and the aches and the pains. Um, I, I decided to leave that entire world uh, when I was pregnant with my oldest daughter, Maya, because I was literally working a hundred hours a week, Wendy. It was wow. nuts. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was burnt out, honestly. And I didn't know what burnout was even then, you know, I was 28 years old when I left, but I was beyond burnt to a crisp. Like I was yeah. done. And I just remember leaning in to, to Jesus at the time because it was 2008 when I left my job. Well, we all know what happened between 2007 yeah. and 2009, and Florida was hit horrendously hard. Yes. And my husband was in the real estate industry. So, mm. yeah, so there. So, <laughs> so he, I remember, like, it was two weeks after he turned 30 in 2007 before we found out we were pregnant with our first and the doors were like barred shut to his office wow. with a note on the door that said, Hey, yeah, you know, sorry, company is now closed and you know, feel free, feel free to file unemployment. Wow. Okay. So we're like, all right, um, what do we do? And I remember feeling like I just needed to lean on God as hard as we could at the time. We, like I said, we weren't pregnant yet. So it was, it was just the two of us and I still had my job at the time and everything was okay. And I'm sure, you know, in my mind, I was like, for sure, you're, he's going to get a job like tomorrow. No big deal. This is one of the most like hustly guys I've ever met. No big deal. Right. Yeah. yeah. Wendy, it took him 18 months sure. to find work, not yeah. even joking you girl. And it was 500 customized resumes, um, of effort. Right. And I remember finding out like, so that was, I think that was like, um, I'm trying to remember dates here, September, it was September of 2007. And in 2000, beginning of 2008, we find out we're pregnant with our daughter. Wow. And, and at that time I'm finishing up my master's plus working the, those long hours at the college. And, um, and I'm just like, okay, but God, you say you're going to take care of us. I don't get this. Like what, yeah. what is up with this? And I just remember him saying to me, I've got you. I've got you. And I never doubted it, but I, but I was so also unsure how it was all going to show up because I'm looking at our, at my belly growing, our bank account dwindling, declining. Yeah. yeah. And my husband going into this major depression because he feels like he has no worth. And I just had no clue what I was going to do. So I ended up, um, realizing that I can't keep this pace with my body between my body growing, you know, my baby growing in my body and um, the kind of work schedule I was doing. And I was, I was finishing up my master's. So, and the final, in, the final semester was an internship <laughs> of 30 hours. Mm -hmm. And so I literally was like, okay, something's got to give. And I did, I decreased some hours at work, but it made me realize there's life outside of my work, yeah. you know? And if I wanted to be the mom that I, I, I've always inspired to be, which was a mom that was available to my children, that was there and present, how the heck was I going to do that with this job? Yeah. I found myself in this place of like really just struggling with knowing that my husband was out of work. I'm literally trying to figure out how to do something I'm passionate about, but we're overworked. Um, and I'm pregnant. And next thing I know, like God was like, I want you to quit. I was like, what? Are you <laughs> insane? I'm not about the homeless lifestyle, Lord. <laughs> come on. Yeah. I was like, are you freaking kidding me, God? And I just kept hearing like, you need to close this door. It's time for you to close the door. And I was like, and, there, and it was like one of those moments, Wendy, I was just like, there's just no, you, I'm hearing you wrong. Like I, there's yeah. no way you're really saying this to me. Yeah. You know, 
But as I continued to, I, I followed him, I followed his path and I, and I said, fine, fine, I'm going to quit, but I'm going to, I'm going to end after the school year ends. So I put my notice in, I think it was like end of February or beginning of March. And I stayed until like the end of June to help transition the next person into that role. And cause I really cared that much about my students and loved, loved my work there. Um, and I, and I was able to finish my master. So, you know, I, I was doing that, but what I didn't rem- realize, because again, this is my first pregnancy at this time, is that as you get bigger <laughs> in pregnancy, it's harder to do the things, yeah. anything. And I, really? th- at this point, I'm going into summer, like in oh. Florida, super big. Um, <laughs> and so I was like, what the heck? So God gave me this opportunity. He, 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 as I was closing that door, actually it was about a week in between, I closed that door and next thing I know, I'm opened up to this opportunity with a um, direct sales company. If you hear my kids, by the way, in the background, they're, they're having a blast. Okay. Um, they're, they're getting ready they're for fun. barbecue. And so, yeah. Um, so excuse them. Um, but anyway, so here I am with a week in between and someone introduced me to this direct sales company at the time it's called beauty control. It's based in, it was at the time based in Dallas. I think it's closed now. Um, <laughs> But I was like, okay, uh, I don't ever think I want to fling products. That's not my thing, yeah. you know. And my friend was just like, Marcia, you'd be so good at it. I just want you to think about it, whatever. So I was like, fine, I just like your product. Let me just get the, let me just go and you know get the big pack. But I'm not going to sell this thing. Yeah. And um, long story short, Wendy, I ended. They have a training class to teach you how to do all the things. And I started to realize, oh my gosh, I could actually make this my own thing. Like, yeah. I don't have to do it exactly like everybody else does it. I get to do it my way. Yeah. So I prayed about it some more, and God was like, you're, like, you have a master's in counseling. Do your therapeutic work with yeah. the women that you get to meet yeah. through this. And I was like, what? Okay. So then, yeah, I basically started this little company, and within three months, I had a three-month waiting list. Wow. And, and I grew it. I grew it for a good year and a half. Um, and then when we moved, we, I'm just trying to, I know my stories are so long sometimes. Then we moved ourselves <laughs> to Texas um, for an opportunity for my husband because that was really the only thing we saw. I decided to close shop because I just don't want to have to like rebuild and with a new baby and all the things, right? Yeah. And I just le- leaned into God again. I was like, God, so now what? Now here I am in the middle of a new area that's so different than Orlando, Florida what the heck am I going to do in Texas? You yeah. know? <laughs> and I, and basically he just kept pointing me into entrepreneurship and he, yeah. and he gave me another opportunity to grow this company alongside my husband. He was, he was being recruited to, well, let me, I have to back up a little bit here to make, to make this make sense. So while he was in real estate, he also had this little hobby passion of his that he had been working on on the side since 1999. Okay. Wow. So this is about 10 years later. Um, and this little hobby of his was internet marketing. Like he would study it. He would eat it up. He would like spend his nights studying and understanding how things sell online. Huh. And he did that because he had a marketing degree and just kind of nerded out on this stuff and saw it. And was yeah. like, this is going to be the next thing. Like everyone's going to go this route. And I was like, oh, I don't think so. Like we have <laughs> stores. Why would someone buy something digital? There's, that just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. And here I am like as a therapist, you know, like uh, planning to be a therapist and like in leadership development, like there's no way, like people won't want this. Yeah. Well, what happened was obviously as the recession happened, people stopped traveling so much. Right. And as we stopped traveling, people didn't, didn't mean that people didn't want to keep learning. Right. Yeah. We wanted to keep learning. So one of his mentors in this marketing world, this hobby marketing world that I thought he was in. Um, gave him an opportunity to start to help him build out this new company he was he had considered making and it was called Telesummit Events mm-hmm. and it was just like this idea of um, yeah like this idea of like basically creating training programs through teleclasses because we didn't have webinar you know or video software yeah you know it wasn't very advanced at that point um, and we would do teleclasses with best-selling authors speakers, trainers on a variety of different topics, and we would sell these online. So that for Dennis, my husband, he was like, that sounds exciting. And I'm like, yeah, that's never going to work. I don't understand. <laughs> like people do want to see each other face to face, right? It's like a thing. And yeah. he was like, 
I don't know. He's like, well, let's just try. I mean, what else? What's the harm? We have nothing else. And I remember leaning back into God and I was like, God, are you sure? And God's like, I had so much peace in my body. And that was like a sign from, for me that God was saying, go, go forth. You know, this is, you're increasing your territory. You're increasing your experiences. Why not? What's the harm? You can always come back. Yeah. And so it's like, well, we have nothing better to do. Let's do this. Well, girl, we took that company from an idea. So first it was my husband only, and he was the one running, managing the whole experience. And um, he, you know, with his leadership and, and the guy that was, you know, this guy, David Fry, who was, he was partnering with to grow it, um, took, took this idea and we created one telesummit. And the telesummit was fantastic. People ate it up. I think people yeah. grew their audience like um, close to 10,000 people with one event. Wow. And people were like, "This, we want more, we want more." But David was like, "Yeah, but I also run two other companies, so I can't keep being the voice for these interviews." So, in a conversation he and I had one day, he was like, I, "And it really, w- it went like this: We're sitting across from each other at dinner, and my husband's sitting to the right of me, and we're out at dinner, and I'm depressed by at this point, by the way, because I'm here in a whole new place, felt like a whole new land with a brand new baby. I had just left." all of the things, all of the things, like my career, my friends, my mm-hmm. family, my support system, to be here and support my husband. And I ha- didn't know how to do that at all. Yeah. And so I found myself in, in my depression for the first time. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sitting across from David and I'm, and I'm looking at him and I'm like, so why are we here anyway? And he's like, huh, excuse me? And I'm getting kicked under the table by Dennis, right? He's just like kicking me like, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, but really, I just, so what is the plan for this company? Where do we want the company to go? And I kept saying we, because I, you know, I was like, you also brought me on to this because yeah. I'm here. And, and, um, and I was just asking, but then as he, as he continued to talk, I asked even deeper questions and more, more, you know, just questions about the experience that he wants to create with this, with this brand and all this. And afterwards he goes, Rusha, you know what? You're an amazing interviewer. <laughs> yeah. You're amazing at asking questions. What would you think if you led, you were the voice of these events? Wow. And I was like, Oh, I mean, if it gets me out of the house and lets me, lets me do something, it sounds great. You know? Can I have adult conversation? I have a good, yeah. I didn't know who these best selling authors were. I didn't know who these like, you know, marketing gurus were. I had no idea who was, I was about to just be connected to. But I just was like, let's just do it. I'm a stay-at-home mom at this point. And that sounds great, you know, because I just yeah. had, this was my first round at motherhood. So I jump on um, and do my first event. And Wendy, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I was seeing how God was putting these puzzle pieces together of, of you know, my, my, my favorite things of, of raising people up in leader in their own voice and their own leadership and also inviting them through the questions I would ask that I had really honed in on based on my background and my training. Right. And here I was doing the work and I was able to be home with my daughter and I was learning entrepreneurship. We took that company to two and a half million dollars in, um, in a, in a very short time frame in about two years. And, um, that was so fun. I was like, this is cool. Yeah. Let's do some more, you know? Seriously. And so, yeah. And so I ended up growing, um, another company, um, which was based on that. Um, it was called, um, it was called instant expert branding. And I built that up until 2015. Um, and which is the same thing. I would create these events, these summits and these comp- like video conferences and things like that as, as technology advanced. Um, and we would help build audiences for our, our clients and we had a blast. Um, and then I sold that company. I was able to sell, um, that company in 2015 and I joined forces with a gentleman named Ryan Moran to build out a business incubator in Austin, Texas. And so did that, um, for gosh, for two and a half years. And then knew I needed to build Perky, but it's so cool because the reason I wanted to kind of share the front end of that and like in a lot of detail, um, it was because I, it was my pra- my first practice at really leaning on God for the journey instead of me trying to control the journey. Yeah. I was so used to trying to control it because that's kind of how I grew up. You just control it as much as you can. Control, control, control. And finally, he was like, no, keep letting me at it. And I will lead you on this path that you, you get to have fun on. And 
even in the hard times, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. Um, and so, yeah, so today, you know, after having built some other companies, I, I have this really great coffee company. It's called Perky Perky. And he led me to this company to invite women to step into their power and to invite women from the first cup in the morning and onward and to invite women to say yes to their journey and to say yes to slowing down for a few minutes in the morning and reconnecting to self before they get into the crazy busy of motherhood, of sisterhood, of daughterhood, of wifehood, of being a neighbor, whatever it is, right? And, um, and that's where I spend my energy now, Wendy. It's, it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of work, um, but it's, it's been one hell of a journey <laughs> for sure. I just love how he's like, let me drive. Trust me, you'll enjoy the ride. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. You never know where it's going, but he just asked you to get in the passenger car and just trust that like just you're trust. going somewhere. Like he's not yeah. parked. You know, you feel like you're parked. You feel like you're parked. Yeah. But he's still driving. He's still doing something. Yeah. And you know, it's so funny. I, I've been actually thinking about that analogy a lot lately. And it's like, as I'm sitting in the car and when I, those moments where I feel like it's parked, it's actually, I, I've been recognizing it's not so much that it's parked we're still driving, but it's those silent moments where, you know, where you're, where you're in a car with someone and you don't know yeah. what you're supposed to say. And it's almost like that panicky feeling of like, huh, I'm supposed to, let's fill the, let's fill the gap of the yeah, silence. Fill the right? void. Fill the void. And that's kind of what I'm experiencing even now in some ways, you know, um, that I have those moments of like, wait, 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 wait. talk again, God. I want to hear it again, yeah. please. One more time, you know? Um, and, and even in that there is, I can, I know that I know that I know that he is continuing to drive it. And, um, man, it does. It makes for a fun adventure for sure. I just, um, I feel like that's kind of where I'm at, where like sometimes when you're getting into the logistics of like building a business and, mm. and doing all the things or whatever, you just, you heard from God, you're doing, you're being obedient, but every once in a while you just turn your head to the side and just like check, like, Hey, are we still good? is this still what we're supposed to be doing? You know, he'll just send you those little encouragements throughout the day. I know that was for me last week was just people kept pouring into me and pouring into me. And then over this past week, it was like, hello, are you still there? You know, (laughs) it was those moments of, okay, I, it, we're only like a week away from the big massive amount of encouragement you told me to keep going, but I still want to hear from you and make sure I'm doing the right thing. Yes. 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 I mean, I, I'll never forget when, you know, that, that time period of a year and a half of feeling like he left us and he abandoned us, especially seeing my husband, like go from this, like super funny, happy, he's got no cares in the world kind of mentality to someone who just was so worried all the time. I mean, goodness, you know, it's like, and you're just sitting there and watching somebody that you love so dearly have to work through their own stuff in their own journey and you're still you're a part of it obviously um but it's so hard to to know that god is is the one in control and that um that he is still present in those moments and um i had to trust that he had my husband and that you know i had to and like you know and i'm so grateful i did because you know, if I, here's the thing, because I was, I grew up in a space where it was always about control. It was always about like, how do we control the situation? How do we not feel the feelings? How do we not do the thing? You know, it's like, okay, there's a lot of control here. And, um, and in doing, and then being in that kind of a place, Wendy, it's like for me to learn how to trust was a big deal, you know, and to keep practicing that trust, big deal. Um, I'm grateful that, you know, he always, he brags about me and he's like, you know, one thing that my wife isn't is a nag. I'm like, thank you, God, mm. because that's like my pattern. I mean, in my mind, I would be, the yeah. nag. you know what I mean? Like because of my choosing my, cho- my choice for control, like how, I'm sorry, that's not the right word, but my preference for control, right? Yeah. Like I want to control everything. Um, and in this practice of letting go and surrender and patience and letting go and surrender and patience over and over and over again. It's this recognition that he doesn't just have me under his, under, in the car. He's also got everybody I love in the car with him. 
Um, and we're going to be okay. It's all going to be okay. And we have to trust that process. Letting go, surrender, and control. I love that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that part of your growing up was just all about control. Can you take us back to, you know, everyone has a story, right? And mm. we all ha- are living out the effect of whatever the cause was. Can you take us back to just your earliest memories of like what that looked like growing up for you um, and just kind of how everything culminated into who you are today? Mm. Okay. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great question. So I think the, the first thing that the first memory that really pops up for me is me standing in a line facing forward. So my brother was standing to my right of me, my sister to his, his right type of thing. We're all standing there and I have this dress on and it's full of flowers. And all I remember was how freaking hard that dress was to get over my head. (laughs) (laughs) That's what's coming up for me. And here's why, because I remember that dress, my mom loved this dress um, and she'd make it, make me wear this dress and we would have to stand there and smile. And backstory on that is my mom was an actress in the Philippines. So I grew up in the Philippines and my mom was an actress in the Philippines. My dad was, um, you know, kind of a revered architect, kind of like the Royal architect of the Philippines back in the eighties. Um, there wasn't like a technical job called the Royal architect, but he would work with royalty. Right. Um, And he, and then my mom was an actress. My grand, both sets of grandmothers were actresses. My whole family was in the entertainment industry of the Philippines. To this day, they still are. And, um, and I just remember always having to be put, like, we always had to be smiling and we always had to be in, like, as, like, we're performing, you know, we're always in performance mode. And I remember this dress because it, the neck was way too small for my big old head, even back then. (laughs) Hey, I have a big head too, so I feel you right there. <laughs> yeah, girl. I mean, you know, whatever. I mean, God made us perfect. So my big head and me um, try to fit in this dress, and it just hurt. You know, I just remember the pain of feeling happy, um, and like, it, like to be to pretend happy. Number one, happiness felt like it wasn't a choice back then. Happiness felt like, gosh, I've never said it this way, but happiness felt like um, a performance. Mm, huh. That's good. And putting on that dress was honestly, it was one of those things that just you had to do to be pretty, to feel, to, to play the part, right. Of the happiness. So, yeah. So I remember that. And I remember, you know, as I grew up, it was always that way. Um, at 19 years old, I remember going to see a therapist myself and, um, cause I had a lot of anxiety as a child. And I remember as a, as a 19 year old girl, I remember going to the therapist and I said to her, I just I don't know how to be anymore. I can't keep this facade of being, you know, super happy all the time up with anyone anymore. I just, I want to learn how to cry in, in front of somebody. Cause at that, by then, at that point in my life, I'd never cried in front of another human wow. before. And, um, and she's like, you know, I mean, if, if that's what you want, why don't you pray through it? Ask God for, ask God to, you know, give that to you. And I was like, what? God doesn't do such things. Like, why would God give me the opportunity to cry? Like, that sounds like the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. And, um, so. right. And he was like, and she was like, this therapist, um, was like, you know, if, you know, if you, you're in this practice of understanding God better. And if, if this is what your heart is yearning for is to be able to stop pretending ask him to help you stop pretending. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay, fine. So I remember I left that day. I, I went home, got into, got into the word and, um, and, and started praying for God to let me cry in front of another person. Wendy, when I thought he would let me cry in front of another person, I thought it'd be like a couple tears, you know, like a nice pretty cry. No. Like, I'm crying. Look, oh, look at me. I'm crying. Look, I'm a beautiful oh, crier. I'm a beautiful crier. <laughs> so I was a part of this group in college called Inner Varsity Christian Fellowship. And I was one of the leaders there. And so I was 19, here I am, 19 years old, and I'm trying to lead them into something. I can't even remember what, but that's not, you know, that's not neither here nor there. All I remember at that moment 
because I just couldn't hold those tears back, girl. And mm -hmm. I ugly cried, ugly cried for like, I don't know, felt like an hour. I don't know if it was an hour, it could have been 30 minutes, it could have been five minutes. Right. It was the ugliest cry. I was like, the, you know, like the whole wailing body, like full on. And I was like, dear Jesus, why do you do such things, you know? And I, but at the same time, feeling so held because these are my people, these are my safe people that could hold me in this also. And yeah, girl, I was, I just, I ugly cried for, I don't know, for a long time. But it was also this amazing release of this facade. And as I remember, I remember journaling after that moment and I was like, okay, God, that was hideous. And also, thank you. Yeah. Because I needed to go through that. And I didn't even know that that's what I needed. I didn't yeah. know I was holding on to all the stuff. And it was probably, if it was an hour, it was probably a well, like a well worth it hour because I had so much built up yeah. inside me um, of years of just trying to hold in all the emotions. And um, you know what? After that, I was like, I was probably one of those like the ambassadors for let, let's just let it all out. Just let yeah. it all out out and I literally would just go to all the you know our up, you know inner varsity meetings you know in college and things and and I would just tell people just let it out it's one of the most amazing things ever and I, and I would just I would just do that forever so um <laughs> so that was one of my biggest I think one of the biggest things that really came for me is this this you know sense of controlling in my emotions allowing myself to stop performing and that maybe, maybe just maybe people actually did want to get to know the real me. Maybe. Yeah. And maybe, just maybe, God wanted to show me the real me. So that was big. That was a huge, huge thing for me to go through. Because um, it started to allow me to embrace the woman I am, I was, and that I, I am becoming, continuing to become every day, you know? I think we all... Um end up hearing these wounding childhood messages, right? No matter who your parents were, if they were, you know, the Brady Bunch or, or, you know, the exact opposite, mm -hmm. you just, you get these messages throughout your life and there, some are direct and some are not, but I feel like yours was that like, whoever you were, you had to hide that and put mm -hmm. this face on in front. Yeah. And that yeah. moment when you were 19 was taking the mask off. Does that resonate? Yeah totally resonates totally and I come from a great family I mean, don't get me wrong like my parents are some of the nicest people you'll ever meet um, but I think it's just the way we were all brought up you yeah. know we were brought up in a society where you had you that you were playing your part yeah. and you you had responsibilities to the world there was also this yeah this other part that's showing up for me as I'm sharing it right now it's like this idea of responsibility to the world mm -hmm. right like you're a leader and I'm also the oldest of my four siblings of my three other siblings. So there's four of us total. Yeah. Um, you know, you're the leader, you're the, you, you know, you always have to have it all together, like shape up because people are watching you. Mm. Um, and so I didn't know anything but doing to do that. Right. Like it was like, well, this is the supposedly the right thing to do. So I should do that. Let me just do that because that's how, that's how it's supposed to be. Right. And so most of my, my life has been that. And it's, it's, to this day, I still battle that girlfriend. Like, you know, there's some decisions that my husband and I are making right now as a family, you know, for our family about like, and I'll be honest, like, do we want to continue in public school or should we homeschool? Do we want to rent an RV and travel around, you know, do world schooling or, <laughs> and, and everything in my being. And even when I talk to my, my family, like, they're like, mm, like at least public school, if not private. And I'm like, ah, but mm. everything in me says something different. Like yeah. what if there was a different experience? What yeah. if? And I'm struggling, you know, and it's, um, it's this idea of the should, should we be this way? Should, how does, how are we supposed to look? <clears throat> and that's what, that's what happens in my real life. And then on the other hand, you know, here I am telling women, um, to stop shooting all over themselves, you yes. know, stop, <laughs> stop doing this, stop doing this. And yet it still pops in even in the amount, the, the immense amount of work I feel like I've done in my 39 years yeah. to get to where I am, you know? Um, 
And so anyway, so it's just a fascinating, it's such a fascinating journey. Um, I don't really remember what I was, where I was going with that other than, you know, it's still a journey um, of of trying to figure out this control thing. Yeah. It's got to be a battle every single day because so many of those things pop, pop back up. I'm sure the first time you were a mother, you adopted some of either your family's habits or what society said you should be. Mm -hmm. And you talked about your role as a mom and being depressed, you know, Mm -hmm. and society, at least in the South says, Hey, you should stay home and be happy just raising your kids. But there's these stirrings inside of us that are like, no, we're smarter than this. We're, we have more dreams than this. Yeah. Those kids are great. But at the same time, like I can't live and die and, you know, breathe just by them. I have to do something. I have a purpose other than just pushing children out of my vagina, you know? (laughs) Thank you. Yes. (laughs) And, and that's so hard to break away from because you're right. We just should all over ourselves, right? We're Mm -hmm. just always looking to someone else to tell us what we should do, what we should be. And I heard this probably a year ago or whatever, but so many women are tied up in what their role is. You know, Susan Ramirez talked about that at the weekend. Um, Don't talk, talk to me about your role. Talk to me about what you do, you know, not like, Oh, I'm a mother. I'm a wife. Yeah. We get that, you know, but what do you do? What are you passionate about? What, what's not just your job, but like your purpose. What do you feel like is your purpose in the season? Mm -hmm. And that's so hard for us to grasp. Yes. We can even talk about it and preach to everybody else. I'm the exact same way. I will preach to everyone else, give you the greatest pep talk in the world. And then my self-care is like down in the dumps. Yep. 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 And, you know, and, and I always, I like to be upfront about that when I, when I share my story, because I want women, other women to recognize like, girl, we are in this together, Mm -hmm. you know, like, yes, maybe I've gone a few steps ahead in some ways, but then there are moments when there's a relapse of some sort, you know, like this, like, yeah. And it's just real. It's just life. Um, and so we just pick ourselves back up and we keep moving forward. And, um, I remember, you know, if I, if I hadn't gone through this journey with Jesus, um, earlier in my life where he invited me to break down an ugly cry in front of, you know, like a hundred people or something, um, (laughs) You know, I, I probably wouldn't have, um, I wouldn't have had the same, the same level of, um, grace with myself as I, as I'm learning to have with my, still in the process of learning to have with myself. And what I mean is I'm great. So I'm grateful for that ugly cry because again, I came from a place where you have to be pretty all the time. Yeah. Right. And my grand, I mean, I have picture. I can share pictures of my grandma. She just passed this, this, um, spring. She was one of the most beautiful women I've ever met in my life. Beautiful, like outwardly and inwardly. And so for all of us, you know, it's like, we looked up to these like literal, literal supermodels, um, as, as what it was supposed to be, what it is supposed to be like when, when you're doing life, it's just supposed to be that graceful (laughs) all Mm. the time. Does that make sense? Um, Which is almost impossible it's to look up to. Totally, it's someone yes. else's life. Exactly. Well, you look up to this person. You admire this person. You're not that person. Right. God gave you a completely different body, a completely different purpose, a bigger head. You know, I mean, you're just, <laughs> <laughs> you're working with what you got. You I'm know? working with what I got. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just, it's just funny. And, you know, and so I'm so grateful for those moments. Um, and just to remember, like, it's, it's just in the journey. All of this is the journey of mm-hmm. understanding what, what God's wanting to, to teach us and how he wants to continue to refine us to look more like him. And, um, and that's fun. That's been such a fun, fun part of that. So can you share with us how you started or even had the idea of starting Perky Perky? Oh yeah, totally. So, um, so when I, so when I have now three daughters and I thought I was going to have a boy. Um, so I have three daughters, um, Perky Perky for me was a, there's so many ways I can answer this question, but the way I'm feeling I should answer right now is this. Um, when 
I was about 14 years old, 13 and 14 years old. I, um, I found boys. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. It happens. <laughs> this, this is a thing. Um, I was one of those kids though, that felt totally unseen, um, at home because for a lot of reasons, my dad lived in the Philippines, um, for about five years, um, in hiding, um, went from eight, went basically when I was five years old until I was 10 and a half or so. Wow. And, um, and so I didn't really have my dad around much and he would come and visit, um, once every year. Um, and so I kind of knew him, but I didn't know him. And so, but one of those years he got my mom pregnant and, um, so my youngest brother was about to be born. And so it was a, basically a decision for my parents uh, when I was around 10 that either he finally make the decision to step it up and move to the U.S. with our, the rest of the family and re help raise the children um, or stay behind. And, um, and honestly, it was one of those wounds for me as a girl not having her dad around. I, I wanted his attention more than anything. You know, like I wanted to be seen by my dad and I just, when he moved in with us, it just, it was, it was like perfect storm time. I was 11, almost 11. I was totally hormonal. Yeah. Boobs were coming in. Um, I, he was trying to discipline me and I'd be like, and who are you again? Do I, do I know you? And so this rift between my dad and I really started to show up. And when I was 13, 14, boys, lots of boys they saw my body, which was, um, I already had like a C cup at the time, maybe a D cup already. Um, um, I was really, I was, I was one of those eighth graders that looked like a sophomore to yeah. senior in high school. Right. And, um, so I ended up dating a guy, um, who was a high school senior when I was in eighth grade and I was smoking and I was drinking and, um, I thought he thought I was beautiful, right? I thought he did, and all his friends thought I was beautiful. And I would just basically find myself, you know, um, dating him and all his friends. Yeah. And um, I then there was this time, basically, when I was invited to call this phone number. And it was a 1-900 phone number. I had no idea. Here I am. I'm like 13. What yeah. is a 1-900 number? Yeah. And for those of you that are super young, those were bad phone numbers. <laughs> bad phone numbers. The home, the home phone, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yes. And they were naughty lines, basically. Yeah. Right. And what I didn't realize was that he was starting to like pimp me out on these wow. phone lines. Wow. And um, yeah. And I found myself making these phone calls um, as a 13 and 14 year old girl and talking dirty with old men. Yeah. And I didn't realize I was being trafficked. I had no clue. I'm in my own house for goodness sake. Mm -hmm. So thank God I have parents that look at their bills. Right. And they saw that 900 number. Um, and that was a $900 bill. Um, they freaked out, right? They, they literally sent me away for the whole summer um, to stay with family up north, and I did. And I, oh goodness, um, that experience, and the reason I'm sharing that with Perky is because that experience to me was one of those moments where I started to learn shame about my body, that it was being used for sex, yeah. and that um, men only wanted me to perform right. for them. Again, and performance. again, perform again, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, when I came to I came to Christ at 14 years old and he took me out of that really ugly place where I was, <laughs> Wendy, and he just, he found me in the craziest of places. Um, basically sitting next to a girl named Selena um, whose father was in prison for something and she became a believer <laughs> wow. and she was like, Hey, why don't you come to church with me? And I was like, what, uh, can I bring my cigarettes? Like, yeah. is that okay? <laughs> and she was like, whatever. Sure. And so I went and Jesus met me there big time. And it was a Pentecostal church. I grew up Catholic, like 
so different. Yes. Night and um, day. Night and day. So I'm here and people are doing speaking tongues and I'm like, what is up? But all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I got to see love in a way I'd never seen love. Mm-hmm. I got to see people express themselves in a way I've never seen people express themselves. Yeah. And it was kind of cool. It was freeing. Yeah. Um, and, and so my journey started with Jesus at that point. What, what I didn't realize he was going to do was start to really shape all of me at that point, you know, mm-hmm. um, long story short, I, I stayed with this, this shame of my body after I became a Christian for a really long time. Yeah. Um, gosh, until I was in my thirties and because Harry was going from this place where I was, of really doing things that, you know, we're not, we're the church says, please don't do that to your body. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Save yourself or your husband. Um, and I was doing it because that's what I thought made me feel loved. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and here I am, you know, 28 years old, finding out that I'm pregnant with my own daughter mm-hmm. years later. And I about cry my eyes out. I'm like, God, are you freaking kidding me? I'm, I'm going to have a girl? Like, no freaking way I'm having a daughter. I'm supposed to have a little boy. He's supposed to have a penis. Yeah. The ultrasound <laughs> is supposed weird. to show yeah. me a freaking penis, and it's not. And, um, <laughs> and he and I, I wrestled with that with God for a long time. And, and then God finally just reminded me in that moment, like, I've got you again. You know, I've got you. I've got you. You've, you're going to be okay. And this mom that you're going to, that you want to become, just lean on me. I've got you. And I'll bring the right people to help you in this journey. Okay. I'm God. Okay. Fine. Kind of thing, you know? Yeah. And, and then four years later, I'm pregnant again with my daughter, Isabella. And then a year later, I'm pregnant with my daughter, Selah. And I'm just looking at God, like, seriously, Lord, three daughters. Yeah. Three daughters, you know? <laughs> And he's like, you have to heal this. Like, this is an area you're going to have to heal about yourself and your body and what you're going to, and because these girls are going to look at you and they are going to be the legacy that you're leaving behind. It's not business can will fate will come and go. Yeah. Um, friends will come and go. These girls, you will leave an imprint on these girls and they're going to go change the world and they're going to have children. They're going to change the world. So you need to work on your own stuff, Marisha. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> you know, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I when fought him. You, get your shit together. Like, yes. <laughs> it was like me and God. He was like, they said, get your shit together. I got you. And get your shit together. You know, I was like, damn it. You know, <laughs> so I, I, um, but, you know, I resisted. I resisted after Sayla. I resisted. Sayla was a really fabulous baby, but I did not expect her as soon as she arrived. Hence her name, which means yeah. um, to pause and reflect on the divine. Yeah. Um, and Isabella was my second one. Was very colicky. Like she would cry and cry and cry. Uh-huh. And she was the baby we wanted and we were waiting for after a miscarriage and and just this a period of having having no luck about three years of having no luck of getting pregnant. And I just I couldn't see God in it. I was so lost. Yeah. And he was just like, I got you. I got you. I got you. And all the while, part of my anxiety, what I realized was I'm here sitting with these beautiful daughters that are amazing. And how the heck is this broken woman supposed to raise three daughters to, and leave a good legacy? Like, yeah. how, how in the world am I supposed to do that? You know? And I, and for me, I went into, and my second round of depression, um, right after Sayla was born. And I tried to be everything that the world told me was the perfect mom. I, you know, literally I had a company, but I, I was able to work from home and I had my team running everything. And so I was able to be like super extra uber duper, you know, you know, uber present with my kids and, and cook all the organic foods and, you know, do all the right things until I couldn't, because I was so I was just, I just, I was so burnt out again. And what God put, gave me, um, in that the gift that he gave me as I went into that season were friends to call me out on it and say, this is not you. This isn't you. Like you need to find you again. 
And so I got back into the Bible and I would have my morning prayer time and my meditation time. And um, I would just like seep myself in the word and seep myself in his and knowing that he loves me and knowing that he's got me. And I would have a really good cup of coffee in the mornings. Right. Yeah. And all of that, all of that kind of just stayed with me. It was literally like my saving, the, the reason I felt <clears throat> like I was kind of coming back into myself. Yeah. Um, and when I started working for that, that company, uh, or working with a company, uh, with Ryan Moran to build out the incubator, I, what so, it's just so happened to be was, um, an incubator that was partnering e-commerce brands. So things that you can buy online, like on Amazon, um, that just sell online, right? So basically yeah. things on Amazon or, you know, websites that just sell online primarily. So e-commerce brands, influencers, which are people that have big audiences that want to get products out to their people, um, and investors. So we were going to create this company and he was like, you're so good at building community because of course, in my being the perfect mom world, I created a Facebook group that ended up being 17,000 women large of like Austin moms, right? Um, which is awesome, but it was, it was for sure, I'll be honest, like it was coming from that place of like, what, that would be like the perfect way to like, you know, make mom friends and, you know, it, it, which it yeah. was, which it totally was. And it was from a really broken place that yeah. I, you know, I didn't realize. And uh, anyway, so, he, uh, but that idea of like building relationships with people really, like that got me this opportunity with Ryan. So I started to build that company and I grew it. I was a director of community for that company. We took that company to, to six and a half million in two and a half years. Um, but my clients about, you know, a year in after they've known me for a while and the way I'm just like always bubbly and always encouraging them and all the things. Um, they were like, Risha, you're so good at what you're doing here, but really like, what if you started your own brand? Like mm. what if you know how to do all the things? Yeah. What would it look like if you did it? And I was like, Oh, <laughs> wow, so that's a good idea. But I couldn't do a lot of what they were doing. I was just seeing what they, a lot of them would like sell like a thing, like maybe a cell phone case or like, you know, um, a battery charger or uh, like a, have a hat company or yeah. something, you know, which is cool, but like, it just wasn't me. And so I, I really spent some time thinking about like, I need to have something that is impactful, not just for me, but for the world. And yeah. what would it look like if I could create a company that really was reclaiming me, reclaiming this story that I allowed myself to live in for so long, a feeling shame around my body, reclaiming womanhood and inviting women to step into their power and back into their voice. And what if, what if that was possible? And so I started to look at different products, you know, everything from journals and, um, you know, home decor and um, t-shirts and all these things. Right. And then I thought to myself, I'm like, what is the one thing I do every day? Mm. Oh, I have a cup of coffee and I have a journal in my hand. Yeah. Oh, what if I get into coffee? And I really started looking at the numbers. I started looking at like the, the potential. I did all this research and realized like, not on, there's no brands, no brand of coffee at that time that would speak to any given person except for one brand. And that was Black Rifle at the time. And it was like speaking to like a very military, like a man who was probably in the military who really nerded out on military things. Right. Interesting. So I was like, there's, there's a con, my proof of concept is showing up. They're growing fantastically strong. What if I created a brand as a love letter to these women that are going through all these hard things and I want to invite them into their power? And what if it was like the love letter I wish I had when mm -hmm. I was going through this journey? Yeah. And that was really it. I mean, that was where it started, but I had to go through this process of really recognizing the shame and the guilt and the, ugh, you know, and to then get to a place where I wanted a better world for my girls, a better experience where they loved their bodies and they respected their bodies and they, you know, they could, they see they can do anything with their bodies, you know, um, and they're, they're in, in control of their own body. And, um, and so, yeah, so it started, it started as this coffee company, right? Like it's this coffee company that could, is what I, is often what I say. <laughs> It was this idea that just was like, I was like, I don't know if it's going to work. I totally could flop, but you know what? I'm going to kick myself if I don't try it. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And yeah. And so I tried it and I actually started it with a Facebook video that I posted um, back in August of 2016. And I said, Hey guys, I have this idea. And I really wasn't even actually going to post this video. My friend saw me from the, for, I was outside the office and she saw me, she goes, you, you're going to post that thing, aren't you? She's like, you know, she was like, you better post it basically. And I was like, no, 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 I have no makeup on. I was just like testing my camera, <laughs> yeah. you know? And she's like, no girl, you're posting it. It's really good. And people just want to see you building something cool and seeing if it will happen. Yeah. And I was like, okay. So we ended up um, putting this video out. I put this video out there, I ended up getting like 4,500 views of this video wow. um, within like a week. And people were really excited about helping grow this, this coffee company. And so I ended up, um, helping, inviting them to watch the journey of me going from this idea to actually selling our first bag. And in January of 2017, we sold over a thousand bags of coffee that first month. Wow. So that was pretty fun. Um, and it's just continuing to grow from there. And, you know, at this point, like we're at a place where the brand is, is wanting to grow again. You know, it's wanting to like become a toddler now. Um, and it's, it's wanting to, to go into more of that conversation of inviting women to step into their power, more into the conversation of, um, of coffee for sure. And adding more, more roasts and stuff, but also, um, uh, having a media wing of our brand where we're really embracing this conversation, um, of stepping up and showing up and rising up. I'm just listening to you just, talk of, about all these things that you've done, which are, uh, incredible. Um, but also <laughs> you just have this legacy of, of strength and success and being willing and open to failure. If, mm. you know, just trying, because while you felt your whole life, you had to perform. Now you realize you're having to be a role model to your girls. And if they don't, if all they see is just constant success, then where's the lesson? They'll, they'll have that same thing to, um, live up to. Well, mom always succeeded doing this. Well, no, not really. Mom didn't yeah. always succeed. Mom tried some things and did some really great things and failed in some other ways, but learned a lesson there. Yeah. And you, you're just leading this this legacy of strength. That's what I keep hearing. Like, over I appreciate over that. I appreciate that Wendy. Yeah. I, I, um, I really appreciate that. Like it, for me, I, you know, sometimes I wonder about that because when they see me, it's usually on like, they, they get so excited when they see something about me. Like, you know, when this, let's say when our podcast comes out, you know, I'll make sure that they know cause they love knowing, but they yeah. get excited. They, it's always like in the performance part of it. Right. Like they'll right. see like the, like the, the thing on the other side of it. But, you know, especially as my oldest gets older and she's going through her own stuff and she's trying to wade through, you know, her first challenges in life, like some big stuff has showed up for her. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's in the, it's in those moments I get to be and sit with her and be like, sweetheart, I've been there and here's how it showed up for me. And just being honest with her in that, because she does see me as, and I don't even realize, like so often I'm like, girls, please don't like, I'm just your mom. Like really that's how I just, just see me as your mom, you know, <laughs> but, but they do like when it was, um, uh, dress up like a famous person day, my daughter, Maya dressed up as the perky perky girl. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and I'm like, she's not that famous, but okay, cool. That's so cute. You know, like, but to her, if she's every, this, this, iconic figure, you know, I mean, this, this girl on our bags is this iconic figure to her yeah. because of, and you know, she's helped build the company. She's helped me pack bags. She's helped me, you know, you know, stuff and envelopes. She's, I mean, that she's in, in it with me yeah. in a lot of ways. And, um, and she's building her own businesses now too. And, and my younger two are starting to follow suit. And so it's really fun, but it is, it's like, I have to remind them also that it isn't a performance all the time. It's also the hard work of, you know, oh, what happens when like a whole shipment of your beans, you know, never gets there? Mm -hmm. Or what happens if, um, you know, our bags uh, are on back order? <laughs> ah. oh, um, what happens when, you know, all the things, all the things, right? Yeah. And, and so I have to also be mindful of showing them that part um, of the business and of just life. 
yeah. um, or say sorry when I, when I mess up on something. Like the other day, I full on yelled at them for something that was totally not necessary for me to yell my kids on. And I had to be the bigger person and be like, I screwed up. That was so not okay of me for, to, to speak to you that way, you know? Yeah. Um, and it was, yeah. And it's, but it's a practice because it's, it's easy. Again, my background is always like, no parent is in control. You do the thing you perform, you know? <laughs> um, so it's been breaking that habit constantly and reminding myself that in fact they are looking at me as a role model so what if I show them the good the bad the ugly mm -hmm. of what it looks like to to lead to lead anything whether it's a business or a home or something in the community you know well I think that we only see what like everyone's highlight reel online and we just figure oh this mom just did this really great thing um and just built a business overnight overnight and had, you know, a million followers within a month or two. And mm -hmm. you're showing them the hard work of the beginning, the messy middle, and what it actually takes to build a business and succeed in business and be determined sure. to not give up until, you know, God says, Hey, it's time to move on. And then you yep. move on to the next project or whatever. So yep. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. What is something that you would say to the younger version of yourself. I'm thinking of that 13, 14 year old girl mm -hmm. going through her first experience in um, really sex and the solicitation of sex and the, you know, trafficking. What is something that you would say to that girl who's in that vulnerable state, mm -hmm. um, kind of weathering that storm right now? You were so precious. You are so precious and you might not know how precious you are right now, but remember you're being held by the almighty with love and with truth that covers you in like a warm blanket. Mm. And you can just own that. You can totally own that if you want to. And it's going to be hard to walk away from what feels like a place of belonging, but at the same time, Belonging is wherever you choose to make it. Mm. And this is where you're making, you're making it right now, but you're also going to be able to make it in another place, in a more powerful, empowered place. It's out there. And there's so many beautiful people that want to hold you and care for you in the right way, in a more, in a more beautiful and whole way. Mm. Yeah. That's good. That's powerful. For the mom or the woman, who feels mm -hmm. like she always has to perform what is either like a book or a song or a movie or something that helped you change or have that paradigm shift of this is not my real life mm. um there you know I have a lot of them I can actually give I can give everyone my Spotify playlist nice. <laughs> of songs um if that's something you're open to but sure um yeah, I'll send you the link. You can post it with the notes. But um, I think one of my most favorite songs right now, uh, well, anything Megan Trainer does <laughs> makes me happy. Um, um, but that song, No, that she has, um, it just, to me, it just, it's a reminder of, of what it is that we can say for ourselves. We can say no. We can say no to the things that make us... Um, make us feel smaller and say yes to the things that really light us up from within. Mm -hmm. um, everything, everything that you are feeling about, if you feel lit up from the inside around a certain anything, that's oftentimes a sign to me, at least a sign that that's a yes. It's a strong yes. Yeah. You know, um, things that make you feel small, make you feel like you have to shrink or that you feel resentful for, those are oftentimes things that we need to, we need to untangle and we need to figure out how to, um, how to release ourselves from that, that thing. Right. And so to me, Megan Trainer is like the bomb right now. Um, and because she just has, she, her songs are positive. And also because she just, she just makes me smile and makes me realize I'm a much stronger person than, than I, um, I sometimes give myself permission to, to see. <laughs> yeah. 
for me, the, the feeling is I get really excited about something that's really good. Like even if it's really hard, I'll still get really excited about it. Mm -hmm. But the opposite of my excitedness is apathy. So if I just feel like meh about it, then maybe that's God. Like, what are you doing? Like, just let go of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You get into this whole performance thing. And then, I mean, I think every woman struggles with that, but being able to say no and giving ourselves permission to say no and modeling to our children to say no. And I think a big part of this is community. You know, it's, you have got to find women that are going to hold you to you fully shining in, in your light. Yes. Right. Like you have to, and there are women out there. There was a woman that came to me recently and was like, I've literally, I hear you. And I've literally been burnt by every single woman in my life. Mm. Like I've literally never had a relationship with a woman that felt like I could be strong, safe yeah. and, saying, and safe. And this happened in her workplace, in her home, um, in her neighborhood. And I said to her, I said, you know, are you, do you want to continue to live that? Do you want to continue to, to have that show up? She's like, of course not. And I was like, okay. So what that means then is, is to bless those people, invite them, you know, just be like, I bless you. And also continue to like be on the lookout, search those women out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, you, I came across your path. I am not one of those type of women. Yeah. I was like, let's be friends. You know, it's as easy as that. It doesn't have to feel like you have to be like, make it a formal thing. Like, will you be my friend? Like, you know, like we're in second grade or something. And it's like, <laughs> will you be my, best friend, saying, will you be my yeah. best friend? And it's like a thing. It doesn't have to be like that, but yeah. it could just be, Hey, you seem pretty cool. Let's go out for coffee. Yeah. Hey, you know, we have kids the same age. You seem pretty cool. Do you want to have a play date? And yeah. it's super scary to, to do that. At the same time, it is, it takes that, that little, that, that little bit of bravery um, that you know you have, I know you have, yeah. um, if you're hearing this, I know you have it. Um, it just takes a little bravery. And as you lean into that, just um, see what happens, see what kind of magic happens and, and what kind of community you can choose to build. We're actually right now after this, this podcast, um, we're having our first lazy ass potluck um, yeah. ever <laughs> that we've committed to do for a year, once a month for a year. And it's literally like everyone brings something. We're going to grill out. We'll have, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs. We'll be the grillers, but we've got a pool that the kids all swim. And these are friends that we've made that are like these people. We just moved to this area in Florida, right? So I don't know anyone. And I found myself in this exact place. It's like, um, will they be my friend? I don't know. (laughs) And then, so I finally was like, okay, stop bullshitting yourself, Marisha. Just like go and ask people to come over to your house, you know? Um, and so we did. And so we've made the commitment. My husband and I are like, you know, let's just commit to doing this for a year and see whoever shows up. They're welcome. I don't, don't, if we don't know them, that's okay. They're welcomed here. And so, yeah, so we're starting to do that. I'm being brave again. Um, so I'll let, I can update you on how that went <laughs> for those who need that, need that encouragement, you know, need to see it on the other side. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just that constant, just step into bravery, step into that bravery. You got this girl. I love it. Thank you, Marisha. You're such a, a light and you're just so encouraging and you're all about empowering women and encouraging and supporting. And I just, I mean, we could like clone and multiply you, you know, although I see like such a new shift in women to create this culture. Yeah. Right. Like we're, we're cutting it off. It's ending, you know, with our generation and we're starting new and we're moving forward and we're doing it together and we're supporting each other and we're loving each other and we're not judging and being catty, you know? Exactly. Exactly. And I think it's it's me too. I so love it. And I think it's just, it's that thing. It's like, we just, we're just going to stop playing the game, you know, and it all starts with each of us continuing to talk this way and actually acting on it, not being a hypocrite on that, you know, just acting on what, what feels right. How do we raise one another up? How do we constantly encourage and empower one another to be in our light? Um, that's where the beauty is truly. I love it. Can you share with everybody where they can find you, where they can buy, buy your delicious coffee, all the good stuff? Sure, sure. So um, you can definitely buy the coffee at perky, perky.com, P-E-R-K-Y, and then P-E-R-K-Y again, <laughs> um, <laughs> .com. Um, or you can find me on Instagram, Marusha Murphy, on, at 
Marisha Murphy on Instagram or on Facebook. Um, and then obviously Perky Perky is also on Instagram. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Make sure, you know, if, if you listen to this podcast and you um, want to either buy coffee or get to know me better, definitely do a shout out. Let me know that we met here. Um, I'd love to get to know you better and, um, and uh, yeah, and learn more about your story as well. That'd be a lot of fun. If you want to catch up with me in between podcast episodes, you can always find me on Instagram at MRS, Mrs. Wendy J. Olson, O-L-S-O-N. This is where I post coordinating IGTV videos. I also write a blog where things that come into my head come out onto my keyboard and onto the internet. Be sure to catch up with me there. My website is wendyjolson.com. Interested in being coached by me? Head over to my coaching page on my website. You can also check out where I'm hosting groups, where I'll be speaking, everything health and wellness, and don't forget book recommendations on my book club page. Thanks again for listening. Make sure you subscribe. And if you haven't already, we'd love it if you take a minute and leave us a review. We love five stars. Tell us what you're loving. We recently created a Patreon account. This is where you can participate in supporting the podcast, the blog, and a scholarship program for my coaching services for women who can't afford coaching on their own. Just go to patreon.com forward slash Mrs. Wendy J. Olson. Thanks again for your support. I look forward to chatting with you again next week.